And uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me. Um, well, the latest start was to try and accommodate some of the uh, US-based folks, so uh, um, thank you. Um, so, uh, I, as you know, I'm an economist who has two main areas of research. One is around business cycles, and one is around longevity. And last time I talked about the impact of COVID on the economy, and this time it seemed appropriate to talk about the impact of COVID on longevity in an aging society. Uh, next time we meet, it won't be about COVID, it'll be about something different. Now, of course, what is extraordinary about COVID is how many dimensions it has an impact on. Uh, and so that's great because everyone can bend it to their own pet interest. And of course, I'm doing that here. But it does seem to me that actually one of the striking things about COVID is how little has been made of its interaction around an aging society and a, a longevity agenda, other than a very negative one, like, you know, it's going to solve the problem because of senicide or uh, uh, life expectancy is going to plummet. So I want to try and just go through some of those uh, issues. It's going to be quite a broad based uh, approach I'm taking and obviously speaking very much as an economist. Um, so what I'm going to do, uh, first of all, is I'm going to um, uh, look at what I call the big reveal. What has what this actually shown? Because to my mind, COVID's doing two things. One is it's, it's accelerating a lot of trends. Uh, and we're seeing that already in how we sort of use technology in our work and our life. Another thing I want to argue it's going to accelerate is issues around an aging society. The other thing, as you might expect from such a big shock, is it's acting like a stress test. A stress test individually, you know, how happy are we, how, how strong are our finances, our health and our relationships, but also it's revealing lots of social weaknesses. And again, we'll come back to that around uh, an aging society. So I'll talk a little bit about the big reveal and why I think the interaction between COVID and aging society is important and underrepresented. Uh, then I'll talk some more around longevity, uh, looking at what it means for the longevity agenda. There I'm talking about length of life and how we adapt to longer life and what might happen to life expectancy and do we still need to worry about such things in a world of COVID. Uh, and then I want to move on to the ageing society story. If longevity looks at the length of life, an ageing society is more of a cross-section here. What's the mix between young and old at any one point in time? And that tends to get most of the narrative around this topic. And I want to look at some of the positives that are coming out from COVID. Uh, and there are some uh, around an ageing society, but also some of the, the, the negatives. Um, now, I'm, I'm a macro guy, so I like big picture, uh, but I love the way the big picture drills down to individuals. So I'm also going to start with a poll, actually, uh, just to get a little bit of interaction, but also to say a little bit about how you were responding. So, Laura, if we can uh, load up uh, the first poll. Um, now, this is a little bit about how you've been impacted in some dimensions uh, by COVID. And... Um, uh, I want to see what you've done differently. And of course, right at the bottom is that you've done none of the above. There's a great pressure, I think, for people to make sure that during this time they develop a six pack or learn a new uh, an instrument or a language. But I just want to try and see how much you think, uh, how you responded. So I'll give you a bit of time to vote. I can see an interesting range. And it's coming out a little bit while well, I hoped. There's a nice wide range of responses um, and the the top one we're seeing um, I'm going to end the poll now uh, so the top response we see in terms of it is improving health and I'll come back to that much later because of course one of the things we've got with this health shock is the importance of preventative health measures very interesting the increased focus on using tech and interacting in that way plus the online education. Now, I'm very aware this is a very unrepresentative group we got here, so I'm not gonna sort of say this is uh, what the whole of society is doing, uh, but I'm gonna pick up on some of those themes later, particularly the one about uh, realize that my retirement has been pushed back. Um, so let me uh, come back to this, this first key chart I want to start with. Um, and uh, um, I wanna focus on the chart on the right. A chart you've probably all seen before, it just shows you the world's population uh, and it shows the number of people under five and the number of people over 65. And as has been wildly uh, uh, trailed, we now live in a, a world for the first time ever 
where there's more people over 65 than under five. I confess, whilst I'm impressed by this statistic, I never quite know what to make of it. Yeah, okay, so, but if you add lots of assumptions and lots of values, then you get concerns about an aging society. But if you switch to the chart on the left, straight away you can see one way in which, wow, it is different because there's more people aged over 65, and that's the impact of COVID. So on the left, you've got the rather grim chart showing you the mortality risk from COVID, assuming you've actually got COVID. And you can see this very sharp increase with age. And you know, when Spanish flu happened 100 years ago, it didn't have such a disproportionate effect on the old. It hit the 20 and 30 year olds very, very heavily. So straight away, you can see that that age structure of society is going to interact with the mortality risk from COVID in a really, really dramatic way. And that chart shows you that you know, a key part of COVID is about aging. How well do we age as an individual and also the structure of society? And that, of course, means how we're going to respond to this has been very different because of that age structure on the right. Um, I'm sorry to show you some grim charts. You probably expected that when we talk about COVID and longevity. Um, but what we've got here are some uh, uh, demographic pyramids for Italy and the UK. That's shown on the top here. Uh, so the blue structure here is the Italian demographic structure, men on the left, women on the right, and it shows it by different age groups. This is a number of Italian boys aged less than 10. And you can see that we've got this bulk of people uh, in their 50s and 60s, and this is the aging society. We have a lot more older people than we used to. The red shows you the age structure for the UK, and this is for the US. If you take these age structures and then multiply them by those uh, mortality rates, this is where you see that the deaths will be occurring from COVID. And you know, it gives you that obvious impact. Um, this is a disease that is affecting very heavily older people. And I've shown you here the US, Italy, and the UK. But remember, around the world, there's twice as many people over 60 living in developing countries. So this is very much a global challenge that we're facing here. Now, because of that, because we've got so many more old people than we used to, older people than we used to, and because COVID affects people who are older more, the gains from social distancing, from shutting down the economy, are much greater. We save far more lives. And uh, there's an economic literature that does the rather grim thing of trying to value a life. And it depends on a number of features. One is how long you live for. Uh, the longer you live, then uh, the more valuable life is. Um, and it also depends upon your quality of life, your, your health, your amount of leisure and your consumption. And, you know, if we think about the value of saving lives from medical interventions, which governments have to do when they think about safety measures, etc., then this much older population warrants a much bigger economic cost in order to save lives. So, you know, my calculations suggest looking at the US that given the 2018 age structure for the United States. It's worth a complete shutdown of four and a half months for the economy. Now, we've, we've seen a big drop in GDP, but not a complete shutdown. So we're talking, you know, sort of 18, 19 trillion dollars in terms of the value of saving a life. But in 1920, that number would have been just a third. So the fact we've got so many more older people means that we should be shutting the economy down for longer. Now, that in a very dramatic way, uh, and sorry, those gains are coming from two reasons. The first is that there's more older people, and that's the blue number you'll see here in this chart. The other thing is that people are living for longer, and that means that if you're 60, 70, or 80, uh, the value of life saved is therefore greater using this economic approach. So those two forces are leading to a much greater public health response this time around than it would have been had COVID happened. 30, 50, 100 years ago. And so what COVID is doing is intensifying the risk of aging. And it's creating a very large dilemma for us in terms of how do we keep a healthy economy and a healthy population. And of course, that's a dramatic metaphor for what we're worried about in the future. Will the tax and caring burden of an older society close the economy down. Now, I don't think that's right. I think there's ways to get a much better trade-off. And of course, right now we're trying to do that by trying to lift restrictions partially, et cetera. But really what we want to do longer term is make sure we have a healthy population that feeds into a healthy economy. And if we can live longer and healthier for longer, 
it should be good for the economy. And that's what uh, Jay Olshansky uh, comes up with the phrase the longevity dividend. And I saw Jay had signed up for this. And you know, how can we avoid this stark trade off that seems to be staring us in the face unless we start thinking differently about our economy and our aging population? Now, because COVID is so related to uh, age in terms of how it impacts us, I think it's also revealed a number of things about an aging society. This is what I mean by the way in which it's accelerated our trip into the future. So the first thing is that although I know there has been political kickback against closing down the economy, but in general, there's kind of surprisingly wide support, at least for me, for these policies. And that just shows us that actually we value our health a lot more than our income. Even as we're starting to see governments take away uh, restrictions, we're seeing people very nervous about going back to work and they're rather not. So we know that we value our lives more than our jobs and our GDP. Now that may seem obvious to you and certainly as an economist, one of the little secrets of economics is the things we value most are the things that live outside of the economy. But it's kind of really important because I think also it's a way of reframing the aging society debate going forward. Because we keep talking about an aging society being a burden on the economy, but if we value life more than GDP, then perhaps we should downplay that, that tension more. The second thing we've learned, which is just this thing about bending the curve, trying to slow the rate of infection, is that our health system simply cannot cope if it's overrun by too many ill old people being admitted into hospital beds. So the whole nub of what governments have been trying to do is to keep people out of hospital. And I know that sounds an obvious thing to do, but we've got a health system that tends to be based upon treating illnesses. And we know that's going to be a terrible way of dealing with a larger number of older people. So government policy right now is to try and keep people out of hospitals. That has to be the way going forward. We have to have a health system based on health, not on treating illness. I'll come on to this next uh, lesson we've learned a bit later on. Um, and uh, Ashton Applewhite wrote to me with a great question, which I'll try and pick up on later. But I think also this crisis is really showing how ill-equipped our language is around old and aging and the stereotypes that come with that. And actually, I think one of the positives is that we can see that debate starting to shift already. Uh, less positive is we've just obviously shown how inadequate our current arrangements are. I know you're coming from all sorts of different countries. I'm speaking here in the UK, where our social care system has been revealed to be hopelessly inadequate. We knew it was, and it's just been revealed all the more. So our existing institutions just are not set up to cope with uh, aging. And then it was interesting in the individual polls, how many of you said you've been working on your health? just the importance of aging well, of, of um, improving our resistance and increasing our resilience to illness has clearly just become all the more paramount. So, you know, what that of course all means is the issues around an aging society and issues around a longevity agenda have become reinforced rather than diminished by COVID. Um, and I'm rather hoping that that's kind of going to be the big policy breakthrough amongst many other issues that COVID has raised. So I want to move on now from sort of how COVID has accelerated issues of an aging society and raised them in the public debate to a, a more difficult subject, which is what's the impact on life expectancy and longevity. And I, it's a difficult subject to talk about, uh, one, because it's just a bit distasteful while in the midst of this crisis. Uh, and secondly, I'm not an actuary and I'm not a medical person. I'm just an economist who's done lots of stats. So uh, I, I sort of fear for trade in this area. Um, I've shown you here the UK mortality figures comparing 2020 with an average of the past five years. And it's a sobering chart. It tells a terrible story. And you can see the impact on, in terms of deaths of COVID already. Um, so clearly it, it has to be bad news uh, for life expectancy. Uh, Yvonne Sonsino wants me to say a bit more and I will do. Um, but of course it's far too early to quantify what the impact would be. I haven't even seen the actuaries stating anything. It depends on lots of different assumptions. Uh, again, one of the features of COVID is the way in which it disproportionately affects older people. 
And that, of course, limits the downward impact on life expectancy. Um, if you sort of have a big impact of people in their 30s and 40s, you get a bigger impact on the life expectancy stats. But it's clear for 2020, if you do some back of the envelope calculations, that for you know, the, uh, the, the improvements in mortality that we've seen from people in their uh, 80s, we could well lose a decade of that progress. So it's, it's obvious that 2020 is going to be bad. I think the bigger issue is what's going to happen longer term. So here there's a, a famous chart, best practice life expectancy. And what this shows is at any point in time, the country with the highest average life expectancy at birth, that country changes over time. Currently right at the end, it's Hong Kong. Uh, uh, females born in Hong Kong today have the highest average life expectancy of anyone. And of course, if you go back to 1918, 1920, uh, the First World War, the, the Spanish flu, you can see a dip, but then you see this extraordinary progress afterwards. So the question is, what will be the long run impact of COVID? Does it change these trends? And that you know, is what we don't yet know. Uh, clearly, if we discover a vaccine, if we discover herd immunity, then there will be no long run impact. Things will carry on. I think a really interesting question is, do we infer from COVID that pandemics will become more common? And of course, if they do, that will lower our trend forecast for life expectancy. Um, the trouble with that is that we just got this observation and I wanna make a little bit of a point about this because the hardest thing in the world to do in statistics is to draw long run implications from short term events. We simply just do not know how this will affect long-term trends. So can we draw an inference from COVID that pandemics are now going to be more frequent? And you know, updating the statistics is gonna be really tough for the actuaries because there's gonna to have to be a lot of judgment calls to be made. The statistics on their own won't provide us an answer to those long-run trend issues. And there's lots of issues to make judgments about. Will the people who survive from COVID be fitter uh, or will they be impaired and weaker? Uh, will the fact you're all busy working your health actually improve mortality and uh, uh, life expectancy going forward? And I think you know one of the things for these long run forecasts of life expectancy, I suspect that if you were an optimist before, you'll still remain an optimist. And if you're a pessimist before, you'll still be a pessimist. Um, I think if you were to do a purely statistical approach, clearly there is no good news in COVID about future life expectancy. And that would then suggest that you want to be less optimistic than before. Um, so you know, that would be the sort of the balanced approach. But you know, this, this long run trend to increase, I suspect, is not going to be, your views on that is not going to be that affected by what is happening uh, to COVID today. More challenging, I think, is what's going to happen around the world. I can see lots of questions coming up. I'm afraid I, I'm going to have to try and look through the chat questions later and see if I can reply uh, individually. It's, it's uh, not possible to pick those up right here on my own now. But I think what is interesting, of course, you can see a lot of diversity across countries here. Uh, I mentioned Hong Kong has the best practice life expectancy. I was looking at the numbers today from Hong Kong. Hong Kong's had four deaths from COVID. Only four, quite extraordinary. So best practice life expectancy certainly in 2020 doesn't look like it's going to be much affected in Hong Kong. But clearly given those UK numbers, they will be. And so what I've got here is a picture of how a number of countries have been falling short from best practice. And you can see the US and UK right there at the bottom. Uh, and of course, the US has until recently been having declining life expectancy. So we are seeing, I mentioned a stress test here, a difference in those countries where people have got good health and the system can insulate them from bad things. And those where they are not getting that insulation. So we're gonna see a lot of divergence in life expectancy. Um, and given those Hong Kong numbers, we may not see a diminution of best practice. The other thing that sort of worries me about all of this, and so I'm, I'm, I'm not an actuary, so I'm not gonna uh, create a forecast and we just haven't got enough data yet. But there are two different ways of looking at life expectancy, as you're probably aware statistically. There's what's called a period of measure a cohort measure. And it's a slightly uh, nerdy statistical point, but it's an important one because most governments and most of the media discussion 
focus on the period measure of life expectancy. And the way that's calculated is you effectively assume a child born today lives their entire life this year. In other words, when they reach 50, their survival rate from 50 to 51 is that of a 50 year old in 2020. And those period measures of life expectancy are clearly gonna have a very big effect from COVID because you are effectively assuming in that period measure, the COVID is permanent. That the effect today on life expectancy at 60, 70 and 80 is affecting that child right the way through the rest of their life. So you're gonna see a, 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 a a bigger fall in the period measures than the cohort measures that try and make a forecast of the future. What will, what will the state of the world be when that child reaches 70, which of course is a very long way off. So we're gonna see a bigger effect on the, the headline numbers. So next year, you're gonna see, uh, certainly in the UK and US, bad numbers for life expectancy. But whatever I think your views are on the long run impact of COVID, the short run impact will be bigger. So I do kind of hope we're going to move away from these period measures because I don't think they're very useful in helping people understand that actually if you're a newborn today, um, your life's going to be very different in 60, 70, year old, 60, 70 years time compared to a current 60 or 70 year old. Um, so I, I, I think we could have some challenges here because the headline numbers will understate, I think, or overstate the impact of COVID on life expectancy. Let me also just come to another issue around the longevity agenda, which is less about life expectancy and more around the malleability of age. And we're all about flattening the curve, trying to slow the spread of COVID. But there's another curve that we should try and flatten, and that is uh, mortality and morbidity risk. So I've shown you here again the uh, mortality risk from COVID. And you can see that as people get older, the mortality rate rises. But what is extraordinary about COVID is how it just mirrors all other sources of illness. It rises in the same way with age as other causes of death. And of course, we know that uh, morbidity, uh, so illnesses and uh, um, health problems are related to your mortality risk. So this is extraordinary because we've been worrying about an aging society because of a rise in what are called non-communicable diseases. So uh, um, you know, things like uh, arthritis, uh, dementia, diabetes. But here we get this infectious disease, COVID, which mimics all the, the, the ways in which those other diseases rise with age. So there's a few consequences that, that come from that. The first is, you know, people uh, like Jay or David Sinclair um, from Harvard Medical School, whose work focuses upon trying to improve how we age. That's become all the more important. So rather than thinking about treating single diseases like heart disease or lung disease, if we can slow down the aging process itself, we can have a big effect because we slow down the spread of all those diseases. And here we've got another disease, COVID, which operates in the same way. So, you know, that the age specific nature of COVID that's revealed here increases the, the weight on research to slow down aging. And of course, all of those of you who are sort of working your health and trying to be fitter, you're also trying to flatten that curve. And ultimately that, that malleability of age, thinking that we can try and influence our biological age or our, 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 um, our physical age uh, through our own efforts is something that is key to the longevity agenda and seems to have been strengthened again by COVID. I'm, I'm doing uh, some work with Martin Ellison at Oxford University. And one of the things we're looking at is the, the value of uh, improving how we age. And it's very striking because with most diseases, um, you know, if you tackle diseases that occur in people's 40s and 50s, then your interest shifts to the diseases that people get in their 60s and 70s. But with aging, it kind of just, the better you get at aging, the better you want to get at it. And you can see that COVID in some sense just adds to that by intensifying the impact of age on illness. Um, it's just gonna increase the need for us to, to age better in a way that wouldn't hold if uh, it was just flat across all ages. Let me then just briefly uh, come on to The 100 Year Life. I wrote a book four years ago called The 100 Year Life. And uh, a number of people ask me these days, is it still valid given what we're seeing with uh, COVID? 
And there's a number of ways of thinking about the 100 year life. Uh, one is you know, children born today need to prepare for a plausible risk of or chance of living to 100. Um, the second is it's thinking about the length of life and recognizing that you need to invest in your future and that age is malleable and there are things you can do now to influence how you age. And then the third, which, you know, I, I'm not a scientist and I was always about the social science, was really about because of the gains to life expectancy that have happened over the last 50, 60, 70 years, there's a gap between our social practices and the length of life we have to plan for. Now, if I think about the impact of COVID on all three of these, we can have an actuarial debate about the first one. My own hunch is that for a newborn child today, um, the chance of living to 100 are probably pretty unaffected by COVID. Uh, if you're older, then obviously it's different. The second one about the importance of the malleability of age we've just covered, and we've said actually, you know, because COVID is so age sensitive, that becomes all the more important. But I want to focus on the third because, you know, I've said we don't yet know the full impact of COVID on life expectancy. But the thing I want to try and focus on uh, and stress is I suspect that the impact of COVID on people's finances will be larger than the impact on their life expectancy. And that means they're gonna to have to be working for longer. And I think there are some positives we're seeing around COVID and aging society, but I do really worry about that negative because the economics and impact of COVID is being negative. It's gonna to lead to a lot of unemployment. And I think that's gonna make it harder for older people to carry on working. So in that very key sense, I think COVID has actually made what I would call the way in which we adapt to our social practices of longer life is all the more important. We need to make sure that we can help people work for longer. And I say the impact on people's finances, I think will probably be a greater one than on the life expectancy. Let me try and move on to some positive things and uh, for, forgive me if it's all rather grim. Um, an aging society is, is now moving away from that perspective of how long life is to thinking more about the balance of it within society. And you know, the reason why we're seeing an increase in the number of people aged 65 compared to under five is not just people living for longer, it's not just that more people are reaching into 70s and 80s and 90s. There's also been a fall in the birth rate. And with a fall in the birth rate, you have fewer younger people. And, you know, this is the heart of that chart, more people over 65 and under five, and the fear that it will burden our economy. So, you know, that's where the longevity agenda comes in. How can we age as well as possible to make the most of that as an individual, but also to support a healthy economy? And I want to just sort of highlight a few positives I think have come from what we're seeing with, with COVID. And the first is a focus on precautionary health. You did it in the poll. You, the most common answer was people were trying to work on their health. Uh, I said that the government policy around the world is to try and keep people out of hospital. Um, and I think we've seen that, you know, that we know that we're an aging society. There simply is not going to be the resources to support a bed-based approach. And, you know, I don't want to sort of say we've cracked the problem, but I do think we're starting to see, particularly around technology, something of a shift towards preventative precautionary measures of health. Um, and of course, technology we've always known is going to play a role in that. So consulting with doctors, uh, AI diagnostics, uh, data tracking have all had a step increase during this time period. Uh, as I mentioned, I think with an aging society and technology, COVID has really um, boosted some trends that we knew were coming. Obviously, it's still early days. Some of the technology isn't very good. I'm sure you know, we're all fed up with Zoom, et cetera. But clearly, there's been a step change in some of our practices. And that, I think, the underlying uh, awareness of how important our health is in affecting our in outcomes to various diseases has been a positive. Now, if you take that approach, then there's another curve that needs flattening. And I said earlier that, you know, how we age is malleable. This is sort of evidence of that. This is shown you by different uh, income groups um, at different ages, how many health problems or multi-morbidities people have got. So uh, this is UK data. So if you look at people aged 60 to 64, uh, this is the uh, highest income group, the top 10%. Uh, 
uh, and one in three have uh, got a morbidity. But if you go up to the lowest income group, it's a half. Now, that is a cost. We just said that if people uh, are vulnerable to illness, they're gonna clog up the hospital system. It's gonna be a drain on the economy. So we wanna make sure that we can push this curve to the right, that people age better. But of course, this should be an easy win. Getting people to catch up with the existing best practice should be easier than pushing out best practice. And I can't help but think, you know, if I said earlier that given the lives that are being saved, it's sensible to see this big drop in the economy. So Case and Deaton have done a lot of work, what I call the deaths of despair in America, and how you've seen this big increase in the deaths from uh, alcohol, uh, drug addiction, and suicide. And it's 160,000 people in 2017, according to the US government statistics. And you know, if you look at the, the, the impact we've had on trying to reduce mortality from COVID, that number would also suggest a very, very large amount of money should be spent on trying to tackle some of those underlying social problems. I said earlier that one of the things we've learned from this crisis is we value life more than B. That has a very important implication for how governments should measure their economic success. Now, I want to move on to uh, another uh, issue around ageing. And, and um, uh, Laura, though, I wonder if you could perhaps put up poll two, because this will be a little bit of a, a nudge to that discussion. So there's lots of discussion about whether we should bring introduce age-based policies in how people um, are allowed back into the economy. And I think this is one of the most difficult issues uh, for the ageing society for those of us interested in an aging society. And interesting enough, it looks like it's difficult for the group as well. Um, let me just uh, let a few more people vote. Uh, okay, let me stop that poll there and uh, I'll share the results with you. So we have an almost exact divide about the use of age-based policies. Now, um, it's interesting economics, I can, you can see the results where, of course, if you do uh, keep the over 65s or the over, over 70s uh, quarantined for longer, you do see better economic outcomes. Um, but of course, it, it goes to the heart of this issue about how useful is a concept of chronological age. And uh, that's the, the narrative question that bothers so uh, many of you. So um, let me look at this issue about whether a new narrative is emerging. Um, Ashton Applewhite, both in her email to me and, and some of the things she's written, I, I completely agree with her. I actually think we're seeing a real positive shift in the narrative occurring. We were never going to change our concepts of age overnight. It wasn't everyone would suddenly wake up and go, yeah, we, we're, we're a bit out of date with how we see old age uh, and change it. It would have to come about through a process of incident and debate. And I do think um, COVID has been a catalyst for some of those changes. There's roughly speaking two sets of issues with our current concepts of defining age and old. Um, the first is as life has got longer, our concept of old starting at 65, which so many people use, just doesn't seem quite so appropriate anymore. Um, and you know, I think we've seen in this crisis a number of people, a number of statistics in the press just showing you how people in the mid 70s still have an awful lot of life left to live, even with multiple health issues. So we've got to, had to come to grips with what it means and the length of life. But the other challenge which becomes so apparent when we see so many more people aging is that because of this malleability of age, and not all of that is our own responsibility, of course, there's genetics, there's the environment, et cetera, how we age is so varied. So as we live for longer and as more people reach whatever we want to call old age, that diversity becomes incredibly apparent. So diversity means that stereotypes are less applicable than they ever were. And the sort of shift in how we age, the fact that on average we're living longer and healthier for longer, also means the stereotypes are out of date. And you know, there's so many people here who have been contributing to this agenda and getting frustrated by it. But I do think we've started to see something of a shift occurring here. Um, uh, the, the, one of them is that despite 
some of the sort of more uh, um, headline grabbing newspaper articles and, and web based pieces, the formal medical guidelines have not by and large relied upon simple chronological age as a basis for deciding whether treatment should be given or not. Um, it's kind of accepted that chronological age is not really a very important indicator, it's not just for moral reasons, I and mean, there's all sorts of ways we can go here. But just in terms of the likelihood of success, chronological age is just not a very good predictor. Um, and I think that's led to a much nuanced debate in the press uh, about who is old, etc. The other issue, which, you know, is interesting how the poll came out 50-50 on uh, whether you should have age-based restrictions on quarantine. So I'll just take the United Kingdom as an example. There's more than 1.4 million people aged over 65 still working. And that proportion of that number as an absolute number and proportion has been increasing over time. So simple age-based policies are going to cause real problems here because some people want to work, some people don't. And it's interesting in the UK that actually the quarantine is not, it seems at the moment, going down an age-based approach. And I kind of think that's kind of our biggest, um, it's a tricky one because we've seen the charts and we just know that age does impact uh, fatality. So I think, but what we need for an aging society is nuanced policies that recognize that some people are fit and healthy and others aren't. And that's the kind of the real victory when we start thinking of the labor market, for instance, not as old versus young, because no one sets up labor market policies for the 50 year olds or the 40 year olds. We just know that at every age, there's a considerable amount of diversity. And that again is what we need for an aging society. The notion that everyone can work to 70 is clearly wrong. Um, uh, the notion that no one can work after 65 is clearly wrong. So we need that nuanced approach that starts to deal with different circumstances much more. Um, I think the other thing, by the way, about these age-based restrictions is an economic point, which is that the reason we had lockdown, which particularly affected younger people, was that if they're not much affected by the disease, but they infect others, then they, their incentives aren't right. I think it's a very different issue for older people. Um, so that externality uh, is my tip has been improved and forgive me again for these UK examples but I think they're really striking because we've got three famous centenarians in the UK who have been much featured in the press and what's interesting is that actually not only are they positive and making contributions but they haven't been treated like sort of freak shows they're just like yeah there's a 103 year old Dame Vera Lynn or Tom Moore, who's quite extraordinary, his fundraising efforts. So we're seeing that very diversity, uh, very evident in uh, the press. So I think that is the beginnings of a change of narrative. I think the tricky thing, and I'm not an expert on how you change social dynamics, is actually the real success comes in just accepting that people are individuals rather than they're a stereotype. And so it's very hard to promote that explicitly without drawing attention to this is an older person. So in a way, this is, I think, a, a great soft touch way of, uh, of doing things. Um, <clears throat> a couple more positives. I want to try and move on to some negatives, I'm afraid, before the end, though. Um, uh, we're obviously seeing older people much more familiar with using tech, which I think will be uh, uh, great. Uh, I also think that universities uh, and colleges are going to be in a real financial mess. And they're going to be looking around for new markets and the market they're going to focus on is adult education. I, if you're an alumni of a college, I expect very quickly you'll be offered all sorts of uh, courses to take. Uh, and with people now being more familiar with online presence, learning online will get a boost too. So I do think that's going to be a really positive one because supporting long, lifelong learning has to be key for longer working careers. Um, uh, Eleanor wrote about social care. Uh, social care is a really you know, difficult challenge. It's a can that's been kicked down the road repeatedly, given particularly in the UK, the tragedies that are unfolding. Uh, I can't believe it won't be tackled as a priority. Um, and I think what we're starting to see is a twofold response. One is from governments. The other is perhaps from families as well, trying to use, I mentioned tech, 
but just better ways of supporting people uh, socially, not just through the, the formal sector. Let me come on to the negatives that worry me uh, about COVID. And obviously COVID has been very bad news for the economy. It's led to a big increase in government debt and it's made our economic future in the next year, five years, less rosy. And of course, everything is easier to deal with when you've got money and everything is easier to deal with as a government when you've got economic growth. So this, the, the ability to fund and deal with an aging society has been diminished. And at an individual level, uh, I think the need to work longer has increased. You know, I didn't quite know to put this on a sort of negative or a positive for an aging society because the, the need and the political pressure for longer working careers will be significant. I noticed about 4% of you that worked out your retirement will be later. But you know, I, you're going to see people whose savings have been depleted because of uh, the drain of uh, the crisis. If you've funded your pension, that's going to have gone down. And state pensions will definitely be under threat. In the UK, we have a thing called the uh, triple lock, which is, works very nicely for pensioners, but I, will I think be taken away. So there's a need to work longer. And then of course, unemployment has increased dramatically. And I'll touch on that in a second. And then there's the generation blame game. Let me try and focus on the economics for a moment. And I'll come back to some questions that uh, um, Anna Dixon and Yvonne Sonsino asked. Um, as you can see here from this chart, over the last uh, decade, um, the uh, biggest driver behind rising employment has been the over 55s. In fact, if you look at the G7, 100% of all the increase in employment since 2008 has come from workers over 55, which is extraordinary. And it's fantastic. And it does show that despite whatever age discrimination there is out there, uh, you know, progress is being made. But of course, that's also in a background when unemployment was very, very low. Uh, and, uh, you know, firms would start to look around for older workers because there were fewer younger workers who were looking for a job. And then you have this huge spike in unemployment. And that's why I think in two ways. The first is that uh, it may be that older workers will bear the brunt of uh, redundancies. They tend to uh, be more expensive. But the real problem, I think, or the bigger problem, not the real problem, the bigger problem is shown in this bottom chart here, which is the work of David Neumark and co-authors, which shows how uh, there's age discrimination in hiring. And it seems to be somewhat more marked in women than it does in men. So, you know, that's uh, a challenge because there's a need to work longer if finances are depleted. Uh, unemployment's higher, so people will be looking for jobs, and then there's uh, age discrimination. Uh, and Yvonne was mentioning that with her clients, she's seeing already uh, companies suggesting that they're going to focus on younger workers. Now, I'd say from a policy point of view, I think that's probably appropriate. We know that the, uh, the impact from not getting a job early on in your life is huge. So trying to make sure that younger workers uh, get up, uh, get jobs, get onto the labour market is really, really important um, because it has a huge impact on their wealth. So then the question is, well, what does that imply for older workers and what case can you make for firms to still hire older workers? There are, are still very strong ones. Uh, we know that diversity of any team increases productivity, including age. We know that certain skills tend to come up more in older workers than younger workers, particularly making teams work. And with an aging consumer base, having an aging workforce is probably gonna be a better match as well. Um, but it's clearly going to be harder now than when unemployment was very, very low. Uh, I think another thing is that older workers tend to be uh, more willing or more comfortable to work flexibly, which normally comes with a lower wage. So there's that as well. But it's hard to, to avoid the conclusion that older workers are going to have to get more involved in the gig economy if they can't get hired properly and they're going to have to do more in the way of startups and uh, entrepreneurships uh, and I think helping them do that is going to be a very big uh, charitable and policy uh, activity and then of course what everyone else will be doing in their 40s and 50s if they've got a job in their 60s is working on those skills that I mentioned earlier to maintain their employability. Um, I want to just move on quickly to the generational 
blame game. Uh, and uh, Ashton's comment about changing a narrative around aging, this is the one that I think is most important to be changed. We have this tendency to look about a battle between the young and the old. And of course, the fact that the young have been most affected by the closing of the economy and the health gains have gone more to the old has been playing out this debate in the press. And there's this ridiculous, for me, debate about Gen X versus baby boomers, etc. Um, I sort of see this as a form of demographic astrology. The notion that your character is shaped by the dates in which you were born, it seems to be somewhat overstated, but it's something that we all tend to like. Um, and we've got to move away from this zero-sum game. And I think that's the narrative that I would most like to try and change. And let me try and sort of tell you why I think society is out of date with these generational stories. And here I'm going to not talk about baby boomers and millennials, but more about young and old. And, you know, it's a zero-sum game if the young don't become old. And of course, for most of history, that's kind of been true. Even if we go back to the Spanish flu, a 20-year-old US male had only a 50% chance of making it to 70. Now it's kind of 90%. So it just was kind of selfish reasons. A 20 year old today should be very interested in how society looks after 70 year olds in the face of a one in 50 year pandemic. This young versus old is the aging society story. It's about different groups in society conflicting. But the longevity approach says, well, actually I will one day be old. I think is really important, which is not yet reflected in our uh, public debate. And then, of course, the other thing I think is interesting is that, you know, we are beginning to see in the press this generational debate. But by and large, I think, you know, again, the political protests, given how bad the economic recession is we're seeing, has been quite modest. And I think that's because another big change has happened. In 1920, that 20 year old US male probably only had one surviving grandparent. Now they may well have all four uh, still uh, alive. And I do think, you know, that you kind of can see the value of social distancing is actually occurring in your, in your family in a way that it wouldn't in 1920. So I think, you know, this young versus old comes out from an aging society story. But if you think about longevity, you recognize that it's not a zero sum game anymore. And here I'll just borrow the words of uh, you know, uh, Laura Carstensen from Stanford, who says, we just need a new map of life to deal with how long we're living for. Now that's incredibly apparent the young who kind of have the greatest life expectancy and have an educational system a career system a pension system that just won't work for them. and covid has probably made that worse so there's a real challenge uh, for that younger group but you now as i've suggested for those in their 40s 50s and 60s they're probably now going to have to work for longer and there's an education and pension system that probably isn't going to support their longer lives and we're also seeing a health and care system that isn't keeping older people safe given the numbers of them who are vulnerable. So kind of, it's not just this conflict. We, we just need a new map of life. And if we can try and focus on an intergenerational perspective on this and think about how we get a, um, an equality of opportunity over the lifetime that isn't advantaging one group or another, it's a joint enterprise. We're just seeing across the board this stress test from COVID how our, our institutions don't support long lives. Uh, so um, we're coming very close to the end. I'm going to do one more poll uh, because before I do a, a summary. So Laura, if you could perhaps just load this. Uh, thank you, Laura. Um, so I'm just interested to get your opinion about what you think the lasting uh, impact of COVID would be. You can uh, answer none of them. Uh, you can answer multiple ones. But I'm just trying to interest to get your opinions, not necessarily based on what I've been talking about, but how you think COVID will impact uh, an aging society and longevity. Uh, so fingers on your buttons, please. Uh, I can see lots of chats. I'm looking forward to going through the chat later. Uh, it's um, uh, I, too much multitasking for me to reply to them as I talk, but I will try and follow up and please do email me um, if you have burning questions as well. <clears throat> uh, 
I'm going to end the poll uh, in a few seconds. We'll just wait for more than uh, 200 people to vote it. Um, so what have we got? Um, okay, so uh, going right back to our first vote, uh, a focus on individuals' health, uh, government shifting preventative health, and people having to work for longer. Uh, so uh, it's kind of clear, it's a little bit, I think, too, on the health side, bizarrely, the impact of COVID seems to be remind us the need to invest in it. On the working for longer side, it's sort of a negative. Um, that's going to be a, a challenge. Let me just try and, and um, summarize. Uh, COVID has, it has done, I think, in so many other ways, has acted as a stress test and accelerating our arrival into the future. Rather than transform our future, it's made the future that was coming along happen quicker. Um, if we're going to achieve a healthy economy and a healthier population, we know we have to do a major shift towards preventative health and the whole notion of improving how we age and focusing on that gets important all the more. Um, I do think there's been a positive shift in narrative around the concepts of age and how complicated a topic it is and how chronological age really isn't a very important indicator and we've got out of date views on that. Um, I do worry about the intergenerational conflict, and I think that's something we really have to try and tackle. Um, the working longer agenda, which has always been, to me, key to make sure that we can translate the fact that on average, we're living longer and healthier for longer into good news for the economies. How do we support people working longer? And that's not about making them work longer, that's about supporting them. But clearly the labour market is going to be a tough place for older workers. And we've had this big focus uh, in the polls from your responses about health and about working longer. I think there's sort of two ways to think about how longevity changes the agenda. There's, there's life insurance issues, which are sort of how do I minimize the problems and risk of dying early? And then there's a longevity insurance issue, which is how do I avoid the problems of living too long? And you know, at an individual level, we've got that health is your best form of life insurance. So investing and improving that is critical at an individual level. The working for longer one, I mean, you can't influence the rate of unemployment, but the best form of longevity insurance there is simply to update your skills and keep working on your employability. Um, those two seem to be the two things that come out and they were always the key parts of the longevity agenda for the individual. There's a huge amount for our medical profession uh, and for our public health and for our firms and our governments to support us too. But investing in our health remains the best form of life insurance and investing in your skills, a critical part of your longevity insurance. And um, thank you very much. I really appreciate you joining me. I uh, hope you've enjoyed it. Please do keep in touch. Um, there's uh, uh, the website. We'll have the video up for you to uh, look at later uh, and uh, a short piece I've written on this. And the next webinar is on June the 18th. Uh, I have a new book coming out, which will be a little bit about what the next session is about. But I want to try and think more about the social individual issues of how tech and longevity are changing the nature of the job market and also our careers. And I hope I won't have to talk about COVID then. Uh, it's time to move on for me, I think, onto other topics. Thank you very, very much for your time. Thank you.